Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those sheltering in the dark with us for the first time, welcome. We like to think we're safe when we can see what is around us, but we're only seeing certain dimensions. When we open our eyes to what is beyond, we can see all of the goodness that truly surrounds us and the evil lurking behind us as well. First, a ghost stirs when two girls are left alone. Next, we see what is looking back at you in the mirror. After that, a prank phone call turns into a real threat. Finally, in our featured story, two bullied kids get more help than they bargained for. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary at snarl.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, but you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcasts or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Lurking behind you. Fear can bring even the strongest of us to our knees. Bravery is not the absence of fear. It is the willingness to face fear head on. Like in this story inspired by Eva Sophie. In a small town in northern Norway lived two cousins, Lena and Nalia. Back during World War II, the German occupation left their town burned to the ground. They had always heard the stories of ghosts that lingered in the town ever since. The girls believed them to be just that, stories. Besides, how could an entire town be haunted? Lena's parents were going away, and while she was old enough to stay home by herself, she invited Nalia to stay over so she wouldn't be alone. Since it was the beginning of December, they both decided they would decorate for the holidays. The house was quite large with three stories, so they assumed it would take all weekend. Friday night, when they went to bed, Nalia had a hard time sleeping. It was suddenly very cold, and she kept hearing the floorboards creak upstairs. It was as if someone was walking around up there. She assumed it was Lena's cat, Missy, but it was still creepy. The doors were locked, and it was just the two of them plus the cat in the house. Lena was dead asleep next to her, so the creaking noises had to be normal if it wasn't keeping her awake too. As Nalia tossed and turned, she spotted Missy sleeping by the door. How long has she been there? She thought to herself. Wasn't she just walking around upstairs? In that moment, Nalia heard another groan of the wood and shuffled closer to Lena. She balled the sheets up in her hands as the creaking noises continued upstairs. The only sound she heard was her friend's deep breathing, her own ragged breathing, and the slow, methodical creaking noise moving across the ceiling. Eventually, her own fear exhausted her and she fell asleep. The next morning, She told Lena about the noise and they checked upstairs. The floor moaned as they walked the hall, but the windows were closed and there was no sign of anyone. This barely put her mind at ease, but since there was no sign of anyone in the house, she brushed it off. They turned on the radio and found a station playing Christmas music. Perfect, Nalia shouted. Let's decorate. They danced and placed lights and ornaments all around the house. Nalia couldn't help feeling that someone else was somewhere in the house, so she decided to stay in the living room since it was closest to the front door. Lena disappeared into another part of the house, and Nalia heard movement upstairs again. She heard Lena faintly calling her from somewhere in the huge house. What? I can't hear you. Lena, where are you? Nalia shouted. Lena's head popped around the doorframe. What did you say? 
Lena asks. I thought you called my name? Weren't you upstairs? Naya said, confused. No, I was in the kitchen, Lena explained. They stared at each other blankly. Then, as silent night came over the radio, they both heard it. A quiet whistle matching the tune. Their mouths dropped, blood rushing from their faces. You hear it too, right? Nalia questioned shakily. The girls weren't sure if the whistling was coming from outside or if it was even real. Nalia turned off the radio, expecting that to end the sound. They both stared wide-eyed at each other as the whistling continued. It just got louder, as if to make up for the music being turned off. The both of them looked up. It might be coming from upstairs. Lena wanted to investigate, but Nalia couldn't muster the courage to leave the room. So, she watched silently from the doorway, gripping the doorframe tightly as Lena left. As Lena slowly approached the third floor, she saw her cat, Missy. Missy was staring down the hall into an open doorway of a dark room. She was watching something. No, someone. Lena could now see what Missy was staring at. She could make out a figure. It was the shape of a burly man. The sound became louder as the figure appeared to grow. What she could make out of his face looked melted, almost burned off. She realized it was emerging from the room, getting larger. No, not larger closer. Lena moved back a step to hide herself and tripped. She just managed to steady herself, but the noise startled Missy, who then leapt into Lena's arms. Lena squealed and rushed down the stairs with Missy in tow. She grabbed Nalia's arm, pulled her into her bedroom, and slammed the door shut. When she turned around, she could see three more horrible-looking shapes of a man and two women, burnt-up grotesques that slowly glided closer to the girls. The girls fled the room and narrowly avoided the melted, burly whistler. They then fled down the stairs as fast as they could and ran out of the house. It was cold and thankfully quiet until the girls once again heard the same whistling. They looked up to the windows and saw the specter looking down at them while he whistled the Christmas tune. In the other windows on that floor, they could see the shadows of even more ghosts gliding around. Oh my God, Nalia said. It looks like they're dancing. It must be the people who died here in the war. It's all true. The girl stared in disbelief. Then Lena began to sneak back inside the house. Nalia asked what in the world she was doing, but Lena told her to trust her. Lena crept inside turned the music back on, and then rejoined Nalia outside. As the music played, a warm light began to glow in the windows on the third floor, and the spirits were able to truly celebrate Christmas. The girls watched them dance until dawn finally broke and they all faded away. That next night, the floors no longer creaked. The ghosts had finally moved on. Thank you so much, Eva Sophie, for inspiring this spooky Christmas tale for us. Perfect in time for the holidays. I will have to admit, the part where Missy the cat was just staring into the dark, it always gets me when pets do something like that, when they see something that we just can't see, or at least can't see yet. Has your cat or dog ever seen something or someone you couldn't? What do you think it was? Take a look at them. Are they doing it right now? Hello, my lovelies. Support for today's episode of Something Scary comes from Lord Jones, makers of the world's finest CBD products. To all the dark darlings who regularly follow me into the shadows, sometimes a little lightness is needed as we enter into the wintry months of the year. 
When sunlight is at a minimum, sometimes we need something to soothe us during those long nights. That, my friends, is why CBD is all the rage these days, and pioneering brand Lord Jones is considered the gold standard. If you find yourself living a truly tragic tale of dry skin, they've been changing people's lives for years with their premium CBD products like their heavy duty chill balm. Because let's face it, after getting spooked by an eerie tale on something scary, you'll definitely need a little chill in your life. I love how it tingles as soon as I put it on my skin. From world-class skincare to tinctures to deliciously decadent gumdrop confections, if you're curious about what CBD can do for you, trust me, you want to start with the best. Lord Jones is crafted with the highest quality ingredients and premium hemp-derived CBD that's lab-tested for purity, strength, and consistency. Lord Jones products have been featured in the New York Times, People, Vogue, Vanity Fair, and more. And now, they're inviting you to experience the finest CBD products available. So don't be a little monster and buy just any brand of CBD products. Instead, try the very best. Go to lordjones.com slash scary to get 25% off your first order. Go to lordjones.com slash scary for 25% off your first order. lordjones.com slash scary. A mirror's reflection can be deceiving. In fact, it may not even be ourselves staring back at us, like in this story inspired by Milo. When Milo was 10 years old, he and his mom moved to a new house. Milo's mom had very eclectic taste and filled the house with crystals, gemstones, and a beautiful antique mirror she'd purchased from a strange elderly man in a bizarre little shop. The mirror had a decorative bronze shape shaped like gnarled tree branches and one small crack in the lower right corner. The shopkeeper told her it was his most prized item, a magic mirror, and would only sell it to someone who had a pure soul. After Milo came running up the counter saying he wanted it, the shopkeeper said that as long as the mirror is for the boy, they could buy it. Milo's mom felt proud that he had deemed her son worthy and hung the mirror in the hallway just outside of Milo's bedroom. Milo and his mom were happy in the new house during the day, but at night, when everything was quiet, Milo could sense creepy entities following him through the house. They had been harmless so far, and Milo's mom would set up crystals in his room, arranging them to protect him from these mysterious ghosts. But the feelings always worsened when he passed by the antique mirror. He could almost feel the mirror pulling on him. One night, Milo woke up suddenly at 1 a.m., disoriented. He walked down the hall to the bathroom and felt like something was following him once again. He thought he saw something reach for him out of the corner of his eye, and he ran to the bathroom and slammed the door. Milo listened carefully at the door, that same dreaded feeling pulling at him. He gathered his courage and opened the door, sneaking down the hallway to his bedroom as the feeling of something pulling on him grew even stronger as he got closer to the mirror. Milo crawled on his knees under the mirror so as not to walk directly past it as he darted back into his bedroom. He leapt under the covers and tried to calm himself, but the feeling of terror intensified. He felt that sensation again, and suddenly, a hand gripped his arm. At first, Milo thought it was his mom checking on him, but then he felt the fingers tighten their grip, growing longer, sharper, and claw-like. Milo turned over and looked dead into the face of a horrifying ghost with an eyeless, sunken, skeletal face. Blood leaked from its empty sockets, and the hooded cloak covering the skeletal figure blew in an unseen wind. This was no harmless ghost. It had come to take Milo away forever. Milo gasped as it tightened its grip on him and tried to pull him into the darkness. 
Milo screamed and fought it off as best as he could, clutching the bed, kicking his legs, flailing his arms and calling for his mom. The ghost was too strong, however, and Milo could feel that he was losing the battle. The boy was almost completely pulled off the side of the bed. The specter's bloody eye sockets inched closer and closer to Milo's face. His claw-like fingers covered the boy's mouth. He could smell decay and death and blood as it wrapped around him like a bow constrictor. Milo jerked his head away and screamed once more with all of his might. Finally, his mom ran into the room and the entity vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving Milo terrified. Once he caught his breath, Milo told his mom what had happened. She set up a crystal grid around his bedroom and burned some sage to protect him from the ghosts. But Milo could still feel them, following him around the house in the days to come, especially when he passed by the antique mirror. Milo's mom remembered the shopkeeper telling her that the mirror was magical in some way. She hadn't given it much thought, but after Milo told her, the mirror made the haunting feelings worse. She removed it from the house, and immediately, the disturbing feelings were gone. Milo's mom covered the mirror in thick cloth and returned it to the shop, warning the shopkeeper that it had tried to harm her son. The shopkeeper refused to take the mirror back and told her there were no refunds, but Milo's mom didn't care about the money. She set the mirror down in the shop and quickly left. Once gone, the shopkeeper uncovered the mirror, gazing into it until his reflection became that of the bloody skeletal spirit. Almost rid of you that time. Almost. I will try again. He whispered to the reflection. He marked the mirror for sale once more and placed it right by the front door, waiting for his next customer to enter the shop. Thank you so much, Milo, for telling us your story and inspiring this one for our podcast. I'm very, very glad that your mother believed you, believed that objects can hold other beings within them. They also hold their own type of power. I'm very glad that she was able to return that mirror to the shop. Some things are more important than money back. So listeners, do you own an object you think may be cursed? Why do you think it is? What do you feel when you're around it? Does it draw you to it? Does it wish to have your hands upon it? Your spirit close to it? Your energy wrapping around it? Tell us all about it at something scary at snarled.com. Thank you so much to all of you that made Something Scary one of your top podcasts for 2020. It looks like a lot of you enjoyed navigating the dark with us this year. But now that you're all caught up, for now, now what? Something fun to also help you decompress, like spending time with your best fiends. The thing I love about Best Fiends is that it's a great mind palette cleanser for me between recording sessions. It's easier to dive back into the dark after I've cleared a few fiends riffic levels. Best Fiends is the infamously impossible to put down puzzle game with over 100 million downloads and counting. A free to download mobile game with over 5,000 challenges with more added all the time. Once you download Best Fiends, boredom won't stand a chance. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Everyone knows that empty threats yield no consequences. But make sure you know it's really empty. Because if you're not careful, you'll find out what happens when idle threats become deadly reality. Like in this next story, inspired by Music Galaxy 917. Seven-year-old twins, Sasha and Santos, were being dropped off at their regular babysitter Monica's house while their parents went out for their date night. After hugging Monica hello, they ran into the living room where all the toys and books were. 
New rule, kids. Whatever you do, don't go upstairs, Monica told them. Why not? The children protested. Because I said so. And if you don't listen to me, the Lamia will get you, Monica teased. The children laughed at the familiar threat of the Lamia and went about their coloring. The Lamia was a child-eating shapeshifter from Greek mythology, who after losing all of her own children, gouged out her own eyeballs and then took vengeance by hunting down and eating the children of others. Monica used the Lamia as a warning whenever she needed the children to listen to her. She wasn't the best disciplinarian and had to rely on unique methods to make the kids behave. The real reason Monica didn't want them upstairs is because she had just taken in a roommate, Olivia, to help make her ends meet. Olivia was a strange woman, quiet, young, hauntingly beautiful with two glass eyes, Monica had an eerie feeling around her, but was desperate for some extra cash, so she had agreed to rent the room. Olivia made it clear that she did not wish to be disturbed for any reason, especially by children. So Monica used the Lamia warning to make sure that Sasha and Santos left Olivia undisturbed. While in the kitchen cooking macaroni and cheese for the kids, Monica received a mysterious phone call. She answered, a strange voice chanted to her. Circles and squares. The kids are coming up the stairs. Before she could reply, the voice on the other end was gone. Monica went into the living room to check on the kids and found them right where she had left them. They were staring up at the stairs. So she reminded them once more not to go up there. She returned to the kitchen and moments later, her phone rang again. The same mysterious voice chanted, Circles and squares. The kids are now upstairs. Alarmed, Monica checked on the children once more. This time, the kids were in front of the stairs, staring longingly up the stairwell. She scolded them and led them back to their toys. Monica was unnerved, but finished cooking dinner. Just before she called out to the children, her phone rang once more. She answered angrily, what now? The mysterious voice chanted once more. Circles and squares. The kids have died upstairs. Monica screamed at the mysterious voice. What is the meaning of this? But once again, the line went dead. Monica called out to the children to come and get their dinner, but there was no answer. She scooped the mac and cheese into two dishes and called the kids again. Still no answer. They better not have gone upstairs, she muttered angrily to herself as she went to the living room to get them. This time, Sasha and Santos were not in the living room. Monica walked to the stairwell to find two smeared trails of dark liquid leading up the stairs and two round objects sitting at the top of the stairwell. Her stomach dropped. Sasha? Santos? She called. There was no answer. It was dark, and Monica couldn't make out the objects. She turned on the light and then screamed in sheer terror at the sight in front of her. The dark smears were fresh blood dripping down the stairs, and the two round objects were the decapitated heads of Sasha and Santos, eyes open, mouths agape. Monica threw up at the gruesome sight and turned to get her phone to call 911, but before she could move, Olivia was upon her, seemingly out of nowhere, pinning her to the ground. Olivia had no eyes, Monica could now see, and there was blood dripping from her lips, framing a snake-like tongue that darted out of her mouth. Her skin was scaly and cold, and she was incredibly strong. They should have listened to you. Olivia breathed in a raspy, inhuman voice, her tongue lapping against Monica's face, tasting her. Olivia's empty eye sockets looked bloody, as though her actual eyeballs had been ripped from them mere moments ago. I am the Lamia you warned them about, Olivia hissed. That was just something I'd say. The Lamia isn't real, Monica shrieked, trembling and sobbing. 
Valamia is real and did not wish to be disturbed, but you kept summoning me with your idle threats to the children. You brought this on them. The Lamia hissed. On them and on yourself. Monica screamed again, long and piercing, and she continued screaming as the Lamia unhinged her jaw and devoured Monica whole. Thank you so much, Music Galaxy 917, for this tale that inspired this babysitter's tale. Who are some of your favorite characters from Greek mythology? Goodness knows there's a lot of them. Jason in the Golden Fleece, Medusa, Zeus, Apollo, Hades, Aphrodite. What creature are God? Would you be terrified to cross? You can only push someone so far until they fight back. But often what they do in retaliation is far worse. Revenge often has chilling consequences. It was a hard winter, made even harder for Daphne and her sister Amira by the relentless bullying they received on their walks to school each day. They were constantly ambushed by bullies who would pelt them with snowballs packed with rocks. Sometimes, they would take their backpacks and empty them into the street. The worst bully was Keith, who made sure to take the girls' lunches each day. They had had enough. They snuck into their grandmother's room and took one of her forbidden books. It was a book that gave them instructions on how to build a mystical guardian, otherwise known as a golem. In ancient times, their Jewish ancestors were said to have constructed golems out of clay or mud for protection. Building a golem was no easy task, but they felt like they had no other option. Because it was winter and the ground was frozen and covered in snow, they had trouble finding clay. So the two decided to mix in some snow and build a giant snowman that would hopefully work as their golem. The sisters walked in a circle around the snowman and chanted the ancient words from their grandmother's book. Then, Amira hoisted Daphne on her shoulders so the girl could etch the secret symbols onto the snowman's forehead. Finally, they held hands and stood before their snowman golem and gave it its mission. Punish all bullies. And then they waited. But nothing happened. Disheartened, they headed home. Daphna and Amira's walk to school the next day was shockingly uneventful. No one bothered them, and in fact, the kids that normally bullied them seemed to avoid the girls completely. That is, until they got to Keith. Keith demanded their lunches, and Daphna and Amira sighed and opened their backpacks, resigned to another day of bullying. Keith then took their lunch bags and emptied them onto the ground. He looked them in the eye as he stumped on their food. Tears welled up in their eyes, and just as Keith began to laugh at them, a snowball the size of a basketball plowed him in the head and knocked him off his feet. The girls turned to see where the snowball had come from and found their snow golem standing not too far behind them, unmoving. Keith was furious. He pushed himself up off the ground and balled his fists. Then he looked around to see who would have dared to do that. He marched past the girls, and as he neared the snowman, it jerked to life and lifted him off the ground. Daphna begged the golem not to hurt Keith, but Amira laughed and (laughs) cheered as the creature tossed the boy effortlessly across the street and into a snowbank. Keith was shaken as he got back on his feet and ran away. Daphna looked once again at the unmoving snowman and her cheering sister. She wondered that she and her sister had gone too far. The next day, Daphna found her sister at lunch, standing by a trash can with a malicious smile on her face. Inside the trash can was a lot of uneaten food and also books. Daphna accused her sister of being a bully just like Keith and his friends. This isn't bullying. This is revenge, Amira exclaimed. 
On the walk home, none of the bullies would make eye contact with the sisters, including Keith, who ran across the street to avoid them. When Daphna asked Amira about it, she told her not to worry. But just as the girls turned the corner, they found their snowman golem towering over them. The girls took a step back as it raised its monstrous hand and pointed an icy finger at Amira. The snow parted where a mouth would be and let loose in a voice that sounded like gravel scraping against ice. Punish all boys. The girls ran as fast as they could to get away from their monster. But every time they looked back, it was lumbering closer. Then it palmed Amira's head and lifted her off the ground. Daphna knew it was planning to toss her sister like it did Keith, but there was no snowbank to break her fall, only icy roads and jagged trees. Daphna had to act fast. As the lumbering snowman held her sister's head and ready to throw her, Daphna quickly made a snowball and took aim. The snowball smashed into the secret symbols on the golem's forehead, disconnecting the creature from its mystical power. The golem fell into a pile, and Amira landed on top, completely unnerved and fully aware of how close she had been to death. As the terrified girl stumbled away, neither noticed that snow landed on the scuffed marks on the golem's forehead. The ancient mark slowly started to reform as it started to take shape again. A golem must complete its purpose once made. Neither Daphna or Amira warranted its attention again, but now it was loose on the world, and one desire burned within its icy heart. Punish all boys. This week's podcast stories were edited by Markia McCarty, Sarah Lukasiewicz, and Dennis Culver. Narration by Markia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman.